Somebody decides to stay out of the presence of the Lord because all the good things we desire can be found in God's presence. Hallelujah. 
And that is why David made no mistake when he said that I was glad. When they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Then the Bible says that in the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy. And at his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Can I hear a big amen? amen. Can I hear a loud amen? amen. Can I give the Lord a mighty clap for Amen. 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 I think a fortnight ago, I was preaching a message that I was not able to complete because of time. So I feel that it is very necessary to continue from where I left off so that the full blessing from that word can be yours. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And so I'm going to preach a message that I've titled if God must heal our land. Someone say, if God. If God. Oh, I don't like this. Say, if God. If God. Oh, say, if God. If God. Must heal. Must heal. If God. If God. Must heal. Must heal. Our land. Our land. Hallelujah. Amen. Give the Lord my clap of praise. Amen and amen. amen. A lot of us here believe that 2015 is going to be better than it was in 2014. Hallelujah. Amen. And uh, I am also very optimistic about 2015. Hallelujah. Amen. There's going to be a year when God is going to give rest to his children. Hallelujah. Amen. God's children are going to find rest in him. Because the number 15 signifies rest and it also signifies triple grace. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Is it five is the number of grace? But here we are talking about five times three. So God's grace upon your life will not be doubled this year. It shall be tripled upon your life. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. And as you when a person receives grace, it means that everything about his life shall be turned for the better. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And I know that that grace is going to come upon you this morning. Amen. Shout a better amen to that. Amen. But if God must heal our land, the expectation that we have for the year we find ourselves in are very good ones. A good number of us want to receive healings from certain sicknesses and diseases that have become associated with us all these years. Some of you are falling sick time and again. And in spite of every medical solutions you have sought, it looks as though those sicknesses and diseases are suddenly becoming integral parts of you. And your wish and your prayer is that God heals you of that sickness. Some of you believe that you're of age, you're of marital age, if there is something like that. And therefore you're really trusting God to, as it were, bring along your way your life partner, the bone of your bones, and the flesh of your flesh. Others find themselves in financial predicaments. You are working very hard, but it looks as if you can only boost of one million cities in your bank account. Some of you are here, you have having serious accommodation challenges. Your time is almost up where you stay, and the landlord or landlady is putting so much pressure, and you don't even have money so if you pay for a man, let alone the two-year advance he or she is asking for. Now listen to me. Any time you find yourself in a challenge that appears to overwhelm you, whichever area of your life it may be, whether in your health, in your accommodation, in your marriage, in your business, in your ministry, or in your going out and coming in, we could say that that area of your life is sick. Hallelujah. Amen. But the Lord sent me to tell somebody in the house 
that if there is an area of your life that is sick, this morning, God is about to heal you there. Yeah. Oh, God is about to heal you there. Yeah. He is about to heal you there. Yeah. He is about to heal you there. Yeah. Oh, can I hear the loudest amen in the house? Yeah. Oh, hallelujah. Yeah. Let's look at the tents that are in the caption. What is a land? A land like we all know refers to an area of ground. An area of ground. Hallelujah. Amen. An area of ground. So when we look outside this church premises, we could see parcels of land all over the place. An area of ground. Especially used for the building of a house or for the cultivation of what a farm or for any such purpose as we want to use that area. Hallelujah. But in this particular sermon, like I've told you earlier, we are not just looking at land as an area of ground that will be used for cultivation or for the building of a house. But land in this particular context is used figuratively to mean an area of your life. So in this context of the sermon, land could mean your marriage. Land could mean your finances. Land could mean your ministry. Land could mean the business you do. Land could be any area of your life that is worth considering. Hallelujah. Amen. But the title of the sermon presupposes that there is something wrong with that area of your life. Hallelujah. Amen. A good number of you here, I know very well, are not lazy people. Whatever human beings ought to do in order to come out of poverty, you are doing them. And yet, every now and then, sometimes, you have to even go back. Some of you are here. You've been doing that business for years. A lot of people are doing the same business you are doing. And some of them are not even as refined or do not have very good human relations like you do. And yet their businesses are flourishing while yours appears to be retrogressing. And of course, it could also be in an area of ministry. You've been running your church for 10 years over. And I know a particular ministry, hallelujah. Amen. Let me just say, not because we are radical in them, no, but so that you can understand exactly what we are trying to say. A particular ministry that has been there for about 10 to 15 years and when you go there right now they cannot even boast of 10 people mm. hallelujah Amen. where there is an area of your life where there is an area of your life that is going through some serious challenges that is going through very unpleasant times that is going through situations and circumstances that sometimes compels you to shed tears. What I'm saying is that that area of your life is sick. But among the names of God in the Hebrew, Jehovah Elohim, Jehovah El Shaddai, Jehovah Adonai, Jehovah Mekadishkem, Jehovah Tidikenu, Jehovah Rofika, Jehovah Husseinu, Jehovah Elohika, Jehovah Sababoth, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Shama, Jehovah Yahweh, Jehovah whatever. There is one of them, Jehovah Rapha, which I love so much. And Jehovah Rapha means God our healer. And this Jehovah Rapha, who is God our healer, sent me to tell you that it doesn't matter which area of your life has been sick for how many years, I don't care. This morning, if God be God, hey. and if I be his prophet, mm. he says that if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. And if anyone prophesies, let him prophesy as with the ability that God supplies. Today, I come to prophesy over your life that in your life uh, that appears to be sick, uh, it shall receive healing right now. Oh, it shall receive healing right now. It shall receive healing right now. Yeah. Healing right now. Yeah. Lift up your right hand and shout, I receive it now. Receive it now. And give the Lord a mighty clap of it.
Hallelujah. Turn with me your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 2 from verse 15 to 22. 2 Kings chapter 2 from verse 15 to 22. I'm reading. Now when the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho opposite him, saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. Someone say Elisha. Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. They said to him, Behold, now there are with your servants and fifty strong men. Please let them go and search for your master. Perhaps the spirit of the Lord has taken him up and cast him on some mountain or into some valley. And he said, You shall not send. But when they urged him, some of the urged him, urged him. Until he was ashamed, he said, Send. They sent therefore fifty men, and they searched three days, but did not find him. They returned to him while he was staying at Jericho, and he said to them, Did I not say to you, Do not go? 19. Then the men of the city said to Elisha, Behold, now the situation of this city is pleasant. Somebody said, Behold. Behold. Now the situation of this city is pleasant. As my Lord sees, but the water is bad, and the land is unfruitful. He said, Bring me a new jar and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. He went out to the spring of water and threw salt in it and said, Thus says the Lord, I have purified these waters. There shall not be from there death or unfruitfulness any longer. So the waters have been healed to this day according to the word of Elisha which he spoke. Hallelujah. Turn with me also to Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles, chapter number seven, verse fourteen. Second Chronicles, chapter number seven, verse fourteen. I'm reading. If my people, who are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land hallelujah Amen. hallelujah Amen. now from the scriptures that we read there are a few things the Holy Spirit assures us of. When we look at the title of the sermon, If God Must Heal Our Land, it presupposes that there is a condition that must be satisfied in order for another thing to happen. Now, in simple grammar, there is something we call conditional sentences. And there are some conditional words, some words that are indicative of conditions. Some of them are words like if, when, should, in case, on condition that, or provided that. Now we use all these words to show that in order for something to happen, something must first be satisfied. In order for something to come to us, we have to first ensure that one thing has been done. So if somebody says, for example, that if I get home on time, I will cook some rice, the person is trying to say that the condition upon which he will cook some rice is that he gets home on time. If somebody also says, for example, that when 
I meet the president, all my problems will come to an end. And I don't believe so in a way. As an example, I'm citing. When I meet the president, all my problems will come to an end. The president will say that the condition upon which his problems will come to an end is when he meets the president. So words like if and when and others are conditional indicators. And in the caption of the sermon, it says, if God must heal our land, what it means is that we may desire those areas of our lives that appear sick to receive healing. And that is why some of you were shouting, I receive it. Amen. Yes, Pastor. What it means is that you recognize the fact that a particular area of your life is sick. That man has been promising marriage for years. And up to this time, he's still talking about it, and yet he's not doing anything about it. You have been searching for a job all around the place, circumambulating the streets of Accra and beyond, from one office to the other. And yet, not a single place you have gone to has given you a positive nod. You desire all these things you are going through to come to an end. But from the caption, we get to understand that there is a condition that you must first satisfy in order for that area of your life that is sick to be healed. What it means is that with God, though he desires to bless his children, there is something he expects his children to do in order for he, God, to bless them. And you see, one problem I have with a good number of my fellow preachers or pastors is their overemphasis on the promises of God and what appears to be their negligence of his principles. I want to repeat what I said. One big problem I have with a lot of my colleague preachers is the fact that they always talk about the promises of God which are good to the members. They hit all the time on what God wants to do for his children. Like giving you a good marriage, blessing you mightily on every side, making prosperity your portion, healing you of every sicknesses, opening a new door for you, making you buy your cars and your houses, and doing those weddings and all the other good things which the Bible, of course, promises us. But they do not spend the time to teach us how those promises can come to us. So they emphasize on their promises, but they don't teach the principles. Mm. But see, the principles and the promises are inextricably intertwined. They are one and the same. The promises of God are yea, yea, and amen. They are real. But in order for you to have the promises of God manifested in your life, you must know the principles and do them. Oh, hallelujah. And I pray God that as I teach you some of these principles, and as you decide to walk in them, whatever area of your life may be suffering from spiritual Ebola, oh, from today, I see that area that is HIV positive. I see that area that appears to be suffering from tuberculosis. I see that area that appears to be dead coming back to life. If I were you, I would shout, I receive it now. I receive it now. Because the other day we are told that Elijah knew very well that he was going to be taken up to heaven. And all makes very clear that he had a faithful servant called Elisha. Say Elisha. Elisha. Now Elisha served his master Elijah faithfully. And the Bible declares that he became informed about what God intended to do with Elijah. The fact that he was about to carry him away. And the Bible declares that Elijah was with Elisha. And they were at a place called Gilgal. And when they were walking together at Gilgal, the Bible says that Elijah told Elisha that you stay here because the Lord has sent me to Bethel. 
But Elisha said, no, I am not going to leave you as long as God lives and as you yourself live. Wherever you go, I will go. And so they continued on their journey and they got to Bethel. And when they got to Bethel, then Elijah told Elisha one more time. He said, you just stay here. When I go to Jericho, because God has sent me there to do something in particular. But Elisha, with his stubborn faith, said, no way. I'm not going to leave you. I am going to continue with you to Jericho. And so they got to Jericho. And when they got to Jericho, Elijah said one more time, please leave me here because God has sent me to the Jordan. But Elijah said one more time, I am not going to leave you. I will go with you to wherever you are going. And the Bible declares that they continued to walk on. Then when they got to the waters of the Jordan, Elijah the prophet, he took his mantle. The mantle symbolizes the spirit of God. The mantle symbolizes the anointing. The, oh, the mantle symbolizes the unction. The mantle symbolizes the presence and the power of Elohim. And the Bible declares that Elijah took the mantle and he struck the waters of the Jordan. And the waters of the Jordan divided, split into two. And they began to walk through on dry ground. I don't know which area of your life appears on shut doors. God sent me to tell you that by reason of the oil, the mantle upon them, the house of God, every shut door, every door that appears closed in your life, as the mantle of Jehovah comes upon your life, every shut door will open for you from today. If I were you, I'll shut the biggest event. And the Bible declares that they continued walking to the dry ground. That when they came out of it, then the Bible declares that suddenly chariots of fire and horses of fire came to separate Elijah from Elisha. Then suddenly by a wailing wind, Elijah was being taken away. But before then, when Elijah had seen the stubborn faith and the loyalty of the servant Elisha, Elisha had something that he wanted from the master. So Elijah knew it and said, what do you want me to do for you? Then he said unto the master, I want a double portion of your anointing. I want a double portion of your spirit. Some of you would have said, I want double money. I want double job. I want double business. I want double progress. But Elisha knew what the anointing could do. He knew that when a man carries anointing, nothing can stand in the way of that person. Anytime somebody receives the anointing of the Holy Spirit, certain things cannot remain the same again. He knew that the anointing is what it takes to break the yoke. Maybe you don't know what even a yoke is. Come, somebody, let me do this illustration. Come here with me. This is what a yoke means. Now, the yoke. In the Old Testament, in ancient Israel, referred to a piece of wood that was actually fixed around the neck of some animals like donkeys or cattle or some livestock with a wood placed in between those two animals who had that particular yoke, the noose of the yoke around their necks. So that with that particular wood in between the two animals, some goods or commodities were placed upon it and the animals had to drag it along from one place to the other. What was around their necks was a yoke. And the thing was that because of the yoke upon the necks of the animals and the burden that they had to pull along, what the animal should have been able to carry or do within a few minutes or a few hours, it would take a longer time to do it because there's a yoke and a burden that the animal has pulled along. 
So that, excuse me, say, you are not an animal, but I am certain example now. There is a yoke that is upon in your life. Now try moving. Move from here to there. You see, it's, uh, it's trying to move, uh, but it's moving with difficulty. It's trying to move on uh, to death that which belongs to him, uh, but he's not being able to do it. He's not doing it as smoothly as he should. Uh, and he's still moving. Uh, he's moving all right, uh, but his movements are slow, and his steps are with difficulty. And he's going, but it's difficult. Now come back again. Uh, I am taking a yoke from you. Now move it. And take that which belongs to him. Move now. You see, he's moving so swiftly to take that which belongs to him. What it means is that when there is a yoke upon your life, certain things you must move and grab quickly. It takes you a long time to get there. You need to move and get that wedding done. It is taking you a long time to get there. You need to move and get that company established. It is taking you a long time to get there. You need to move and make your ministry an international one. But it's taking you a long time to get there. Can I preach like a failure? You need to move uh, to make your business flourish, uh, but it's taking you a long time. Uh, not because you want to be long delayed, uh, but because there is a yoke uh, that is dragging you back. A yoke uh, that is delaying you. A yoke uh, that appears to be procrastinating your steps. Uh, but there is one thing uh, that breaks the yoke. Uh, the yoke cannot be broken by your beauty. Only you are beautiful, but yours are not broken by our beauty. Only you are lovely, but yours are not broken by our loveliness. Gentlemen, you are strong and handsome, but yours are not broken by our physical stature or appearance. But there is one thing that breaks the yoke. There is one thing that breaks the burden. Isaiah said it in Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27, and it shall come to pass uh, that in that day his burden shall be taken from off thy shoulder and his yoke uh, from off thy neck uh, and the yoke upon your life uh, shall be destroyed uh, because of the anointing 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 uh, so say, I receive the anointing I receive the anointing so he said, Elisha knew very well that if I have the anointing, the money will come. If I have the anointing, the door will open. He said, some of you are here, you are struggling for certain things, when those things must rather struggle for you. Mm. He didn't get what I said. He didn't get what I said. He said, you are struggling for certain things. When those certain things you are struggling for, must rather struggle for you. Mm. Because in the scriptures, we are never told that we shall follow goodness and mercy. No. Read your Bible again. But I see, you see, listen, 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 listen. But I told you that uh, there is an if condition that must be satisfied. Uh, what did David say in Psalm 23? God, thou anointed my head, my head with oil so that my cup ran it over and because of the oil upon my life goodness and mercy shall follow Oh God, I feel a preacher, yeah. Oh God, and I see somebody in the house. Certain things you are struggling for, and the anointing comes upon your life. I see all those things beginning to run rather after you. I see the houses running after you. I see the cars running after you. I see the buildings running after you. I see the traveling business running after you. I see international ministry running after you. I see good health and excellence run after you because the anointing of the Holy Ghost is coming upon your life. If I were you, I'll rise up on my feet and shout a receive So Elijah asked for a double portion of the anointing. And Elijah had told him earlier that you have asked for a difficult thing. But if you see me being taken up to heaven, then your desire, your request, shall be granted. So after that, when they were moving, that was where chariots of fire 
and horses of fire came to separate them, and Elijah was taken up by a whale wind. And the Bible declares that Elijah saw him being taken up, and he shouted and said, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the horses thereof. My father, my father. You see, Elisha knew very well that biologically it was not Elijah who fathered him, but he understood that we don't just have biological fathers, we also have spiritual fathers. And if you are close to your spiritual father, if you can sell your spiritual father faithfully, if you can always be at the back and corner of your spiritual father, the things that the spiritual father had, when it is time for him to face off, you take a double portion. You have a double portion. You have to receive a double portion. Oh, the Bible declares that when Elijah was being taken up, then the mantle which symbolizes the anointing, it fell off him. The mantle, the mantle which he wore, it fell off Elijah. And then Elisha took the mantle, which means he had received the anointing. And the Bible declares that he went and stood before the Jordan, which Elijah had made to part into two. And he also said, before the water, where is the God? of my master Elijah that he took the mantle and struck the waters and the waters also divided for him to walk through and drive around. God told me to tell you that if you shall get close to your spiritual fathers and be faithful with them to the end, whatever grace and oil is upon their life, a double portion is going to come upon you. And I see somebody in the house, I see a double portion of God's favor falling upon your life. I see a double portion of God's grace coming upon you right now. I see a double portion of God's goodness locating you right now. And by that double portion, whatever you thought you could not achieve, you shall achieve. Whatever you thought and missed you, it is going to be restored. Whatever you thought was dead in your life will come back to life. And because of the double portion, all those who looked down on you, they shall look up to you. If I were you, I would shout the biggest in bed. But the Bible declares that when Elisha moved on, he got to Jericho. Somebody say Jericho. Jericho. Somebody say Jericho. Jericho. Oh, somebody say Jericho. Jericho. Then when they got to Jericho, then the sons of the prophets, they came to Elisha and said, let us send 50 strong men to go and search the mountains or the valleys. Maybe the Spirit of God had taken your master Elijah so high and dropped him on some mountain or into some valley. But Elisha, who had received a double portion of the anointing of his master, told them, don't go. Who can have full soul happy about this? He said, don't go. He said, don't go. You are thinking physical, but I am thinking spiritual. Don't go. You are thinking natural, but I am thinking supernatural. Only don't go. God brought you out of the world. You were so much in worldliness, dressing in skin biscuits, in your magenta backless dress, with a cow neck that exposes your feminine features in the most captivating way. And we are built was so much so that uh, when he entered the nightclub in those years, all men had no option than to stand and stare and be in awe of your incomparable beauty. Then you entered the nightclub those days uh, and you were dancing with all those guys who were holding you somewhere I cannot mention uh, and who were touching some places uh, that are unmentionable and they were fondling uh, and they were smooth and they were touching and you were so happy about that you have come to God now and you are encountering some problems and you feel like going back into the world because when you are in the world you have some sugar daddy who was putting 
sugar on your lips uh, and giving you some money. Now you are in Christ. You cannot do that anymore. So you feel like, ah, why don't I go back? But God told me to tell you, don't go. Mm, don't go. Yesterday is gone. Another day has come. Only whatever you are going through now, it is just for a while. It is just for a while. Because out of your test will come your testimony. Out of your trial will come your triumph. Out of your cross will come your crown. And I hear somebody here. I want to know what kind of life you want to go back to. You want to go back to immorality. You want to go back to promiscuity. You want to go back to lesbianism. You want to go back to a this kind of thing. You want to go back to all the negative lifestyles you have dropped. But God sent me to tell you that there is a way that seemed right unto a man, but the end thereof is destruction. Don't go and destroy yourself because in this year, by the time the year goes to an end, whatever you thought was over, God will come to shine there. Whatever you thought you have lost, you shall receive restoration and everything that appear to miss you will come back to you. So give someone a high five and tell them, don't go. Oh, tell them, don't go. Say you have come to the Lord. I don't hear you. Say you have come to the Lord. Come to the Lord. So stay with the Lord. So stay with the Lord. Don't go. Don't go. The man may be rich. You an impressive personality. But don't go. The woman will be so nice. Dressing so beautifully. Oh, give me a high five. Dressing so beautifully. In that lovely outfit. But don't go. That man out there. Into a court prison. May give you whatever you need. But remember. Hell is waiting for you. So don't go. That group of friends co sponsor your breakfast, lunch, and supper. A high five. Co sponsor your breakfast, lunch, and supper. And give you whatever need you have. But somebody don't go. That organization that I am to so much fraud. And demonic practices, and are paying their workers about 15 million a month. You feel like I must go back to there. But God told me to tell you that don't go. Because you see, anytime the enemy sees that your breakthrough is at hand, that is why he tightens your problem and tightens the difficulty. Because you see, the deeper the darkness, the closer the dawn. If you want to clap, 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 Darker still. Four years dark, but from five to six there about then suddenly the darkness will be fading gradually. And then to be seven, eight, where the atmosphere will look very bright. And everything about darkness will have disappeared. Mm -hmm. You see, when the enemy knows that very soon you are going to have your daybreak. Very soon, you are going to have your wedding. Very soon, you are going to have your healing. Very soon, you are going to have your breakthrough. Very soon, you will travel around the world. Very soon, the church will grow and become big and stronger. Then he decides to use his strength. Forget about God and go back to the world. He will test the difficulty. He will let you go through so much darkness. He will put you in so much darkness 
darkness of sickness, darkness of poverty, darkness of demonic attacks, darkness of financial problems, darkness of monetary crisis, darkness of health problems. Because you are seen that very soon your daybreak will come. But the devil is a liar. I say the devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. We know his tricks. We know his plans. And let Satan should get advantage over you. For we are not ignorant of his devices. God told me to tell you that whatever darkness you may be going through today, you don't worry. Don't say because of the darkness you are going back into the world to follow that sugar mommy and that sugar daddy because very, very soon you will be the bride of this church's latest wedding. Very, very soon you will come to church with your saluka back outside the compound. Very, very soon you shall be preaching the gospel in the nations of the world. Very, very soon a promotion for you in that company while you are taking about three times your salary is coming your way. Very, very soon the demonic attacks over your life will cease. Very, very soon you'll be lifted from the Mary clay and your feet shall be planted upon a rock. Very, very soon from that